Frank, um, may I start by asking you when you first joined the search? Because obviously you're not one of the original members. No, it's surprising how many people ask that question. Actually, it goes back um, eleven and a half years now, believe it or not. To yeah, yeah, mm, almost to the beginning, because the group had only really been having hits for about a, just about a year before I joined. The, the first hour I was with them was uh, the 3rd of August, 1964, at the Coventry Theatre. Really? Did you replace Tony Jackson? Or yeah, that? yeah. You did. Mm. And you came from what group? From Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers. Wasn't that a, a change in... Uh, almost a drastic change in style for you then to go from for me yeah it was yeah coming from a big band to a small group it was a very very uh, different kind of change i'd been used to brass and brass big course. heavy sounds heavy for those uh, days raucous. yeah very so, raucous kind of sound yeah. yeah much different kind of material as well um but it was it was good i enjoyed it it was nice what you, you, you had to watch more what you were playing because uh, like with four instruments it matters yeah. very much what made you make the change I don't know, I always got on well with them. You see, I met the searchers in Germany. Um, the Rebel Rousers were playing at the Star Club and the searchers were there. And uh, they were never a very kind of rowdy band. You know, musos, uh, typically boozers, things like that. And I never was. And uh, they were a very quiet band. So I used to spend my spare time going around with them. I got on well with them, kept in touch. Then uh, when they got back to England, they made records, had a hit, and I was still in touch. And then they said, well, Tony's going, do you want the job? And I actually turned it down at first. And then a short while afterwards, changed my mind, decided it would be a good thing, and took it. And of the million hits or so that the searchers have had, uh, what was the one that you came in on? The when You Walk in the Room. Um. <clears throat> which was followed by What Have They Done to the Rain and which was followed by Goodbye My Love. That was your, your quieter period, that was even quieter than... Um, well, f uh, so, so. In fact, When You Walk in the Room was a much bigger hit than the one that went before, strangely enough, because Someday We're Gonna Love Again was a bit uh, weak after Needles and Pins and Don't Throw Your Love yeah. Away. They were both number one. Someday was a bit of a disappointment. That got to, I think, about 11 or something like that. So it didn't quite reach the heights that was expected of it. So actually, we were very, very pleased when, when You Walk in the Room got to three. How did you go about choosing songs like When You Walk in the Room, which weren't typical of their day? Um, no, in fact, Needles and Pins, strangely enough, they got from Cliff Bennett. Because when I was at the Star Club, with Bennett, we were doing this one. Someone had brought back this uh, record from America years and years ago, a promoter actually that we used to work for in Harrow, and we started playing this song. This was with the, with the riff that goes on in the background. That was always d all done on saxes when we did it, and uh, they liked it out there. They liked some of the songs we did. We liked some of the songs that the Merseybeat groups did out there, and we took a couple of their ideas. They took ours, and they eventually went on to record Needles and Pins. How do you go about choosing songs? difficult thing because we lo lost the knack at one point um, you can only go by your own taste really and if your own, own taste fits then uh, you're winning we just listen to songs that we like uh, catchy songs as well um, songs up tempo have got more of a chance than slow ones you can always bank on more program plays with an up-tempo song. The exception we made there was Solitaire. We, a lot of people don't realize this, but on RCA about three years ago, we made Solitaire. Um, almost as soon as Sadaka had written the song, he gave it to us straight away, we recorded it. And it was such a beautiful song that we were convinced that we could take a chance with a slow song and put it out. In fact, we put it out and it died a horrible death. And we weren't in competition with anyone at all because Andy Williams got the hit and that was six months later, after ours was dead and buried. This is the story of show business. Yeah, this, this is an answer to people when they come up to us and they say, um, how come you don't choose the right songs these days? And that was a perfect example of um, choosing the right song, not getting a hit. Another example, the, uh, the song we released just previous to um, Solitaire was Vahivala. Yeah. which is now the, the record by Champagne. That's right, yes. And we released that one almost four years ago. A couple of other things like that happened in the past as well. We recorded a song called Don't Shut Me Out, which was never released. And then another group, I can't even remember the group who did that. They just missed getting a hit with that song a few months after we made it. Was vaguely familiar, but and a song cool. called Shoot 'em Up Baby, which yeah. uh, we had, which was the reason for us leaving Liberty Records, the arguments we had about 
that. Uh, we released it in Germany, it didn't do anything, but there was another group, I think called Matchbox, I'm not sure who released that in England. Got TV on it, but didn't quite make a hit. But uh, shows we're not alone in our thinking yeah, anyway, doesn't it? Here we are in 1976. Obviously, you want to get records. Mm, right? Badly. Um, no group can afford to be without a hit record. Really, mm. I well, they can afford, but it doesn't... Um, it's not quite the same thing. No. Well, we can exist. We have an extremely good living. But a record makes all the difference to a, a very good living and um, the great times again. Uh, are you doing anything specific towards trying to get a hit record? Is there any way you can go about getting yeah. a hit record? Yes, selecting material that you think is going to make it. The only problem then is how to go about releasing the thing. You've got several choices. You either go in, pay for the thing yourself, and then lease tape it to someone, or you sign with a major company on a straight contract deal, or you can go with uh, an independent company who will lease tape for you. So you have to make all these kind of decisions. And generally the offers that are floating out around at the moment are lease tape things. And so far we have either haven't liked the setup that the people have offered or we haven't liked the people involved or they've had the wrong idea about what we think. Because the test is when you go into <coughs> someone's office and you say, well, what do you think uh, you can do with us? What do you see for us? 10 out of 10, well, no, 9 out of 10 will turn around and think they're pleasing you by saying, well, I think we could um, do something like Needles and Pins again, which I don't feel is right. I think that's a step backwards. Needles and Pins is a great record, but I don't think you can retrace that. It's the yeah, wrong it's sound it's for now. Thing anyway. Wrong sound for now, unless it happens to hit on a freak nostalgia kick and sell again. So you wouldn't think of going back to the composers who've written hit songs in the past, like Jack Nitch and... Oh, if, if they wrote a Malvina good song, Reynolds. yes, we'd go back to them. Well, Malvina Reynolds is an exception. I mean, that was yeah. one of those uh, little folk songs. In case the people don't know, she wrote What Have They Done to the Rain. And <laughs> Little <laughs> Boxes, I believe she wrote as well. Um, uh, Pete Seeger did it, but I think Malvina Reynolds wrote it. What she did write, I know, was Morning Town Ride. Yes, yeah, she did. And she's a few other things. Also. Yeah, is she still alive? A gypsy, I believe. Well, I know she's an old lady, a very well, old the lady. The last I heard was ages ago. She was 79 then. Yeah. Uh, and that's six years ago, I think. Yeah. Uh, whether she's still alive, I don't know. But I would have thought that, you know, she's got three or four famous songs to her. Yeah. Better, In fact, I can't around. remember whether it's uh, Little Boxes or Marvelous Toy, but it's one of those two songs that she wrote. Marvelous Toy, I don't recall, but I'm sure that Pete Seeger definitely did yeah. write. Yeah, and it's probably the other one, Tom Paxton recorded it, but I think Malvina Reynolds wrote that one. We'd go back to those writers if they came up with a good song for us. But we need a newer style. I mean, it's, it's got to be a bit sort of funky. I would like a kind of free thing. Or the Eagles have got a good sound. That would suit us, that kind of thing. And for Heath Love was a good style. Yes. Didn't sell, but it was a great song. That was Loggins and Messina. Good for us. Has the change of record companies had anything to do with it? You started off with Pi, um, you were under Tony Hatch's direction yeah. initially, then you went to Liberty, then RCA. Yeah, they each have their different ideas of what you should do, and depending on who's running the company at the time, you may or may not get on well with them. Pi was fine. On, on reflection, I don't think we were treated as well at Pi as we should have, can considering our status there. Considering the amount of money you brought. Yes, I mean, we must have been their biggest earners. And at that time, admittedly, we were on a very low royalty because people were in those days. Yes. Royalties were nothing like they are now. About to record something? Yeah, it was, in fact, something around about 25 3%, whereas now royalties are around about 10%. So there's a vast difference. And we were their major artists, and I can't remember us being fussed over too much or, um, you know, things like that. But anyway, we, we left them eventually because of a couple of disagreements with Tony, who's a great fellow, by the way, despite um, what people may think of him on New Faces. I mean, he really is a great guy. We didn't see eye to eye in musical policy in the end anyway, but that's neither here nor there. I think we were both a bit sort of stale by that time. Then we went on to Liberty, which was uh, a bit of a tragic few years there. Could have been good, because they put us with Kenny Young, who wrote... Um, mm, Sand in My Shoes, Under the Boardwalk, right, for the Drifters, um, Clara Rogers, Clara Rogers Hits. Um, he did a song with us called Umbrella Man, which actually was quite a good record. I'd, I haven't even got a copy of that one, oh. so I'd like to hear that again, but I think that was good. Didn't do anything. We did another one under another name called, um, the name was, of the group was Pasha. Uh, this was a, just a, a single release, and uh, the record was called Somebody Shot the Lollipop Man, which was dreadful. It really was bad. But... 
following that, we did Shoot 'em Up Baby, which was an Andy Kim single, Once Upon a Time. The problem there was that the original song had a middle eight in it with brass, which we thought made the song, because it was a very monotonous kind of song. Liberty wanted the record released without the middle eight in. We were adamant that it should be released in its full version, and we just agreed to part. It was as simple as that. Felt we were getting nowhere, and we had to put up a stand. So from there, we um, made an independent record with David Paramore, as Nari Paramore's nef nephew, in fact. Nephew, yeah, nephew. Sorry, yeah. And we did a song called Desdemona, written by Valerie Avon and Harold Spiro. Valerie Avon used to be with the Avon, you know, the Avons, the group. And the original demo, the demo that we had of that, was actually Elton John on it, when he was doing demos at uh, Dick James and things like that. So we recorded that. Good song, nice and bright, and in fact it was a minor hit in the States. Just a local area hit, but it got to uh, about 50-something. I can't remember the, the final figure, but it was 50-odd in the States anyway. That's what they call a regional breakout, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Unfortunately, it didn't break out anywhere else. But it was in the national charts, that's the main thing it showed. Didn't do anything in England, but it gave RCA a bit of interest in us. They were quite good in lots of ways, because they gave us all the studio time. The trouble was the person looking after us there actually really wanted us to go back to our old style. And as a favor, so that we could get our own way in some things, we did a, a re-recorded album of the old hits again, which isn't, you know, not a great album. No. I don't really like old hits re-recorded anyway, though I think they're it's always best. It's a great step, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so we did it so that we could get our way in other ways, because they figured they could make money on that uh, with the cabaret circuit and things like that. And it sold a lot of records. But it was a fighting, you know, difference of opinion all the time there of what they wanted us to do and what we wanted to do. We did a song called Spicks and Specks, which was a Bee Gees song, which we hated. Um, did that to please them. That was on the B side of Solitaire. No, was it? It was on the B side of Solitaire. Yes, I think it was. Yes, you're right. I am right. I mean, not you're right. right. Yes. yes. We haven't got the copy, so I can't say. It. Yes, it is. Um, but that was a song we didn't want to do. Eventually. Uh, we came to um, a head with those. In fact, RCA was a good thing and a bad thing. And more than that, it's difficult to say. Well, at this point, Frank, could we ask you to select one of your songs other than Solitaire? One of our songs? <clears throat> one of the singles or...? Um... One of the singles, yes, or a track from another. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, why don't... You probably haven't... Have you got the records? We've got most of them. Those mm. we haven't got... I'm hoping that we'll be able to acquire Okay, well, if you can get it, I'd like people to hear our version of Vahivala so that they can compare it, see what they think of it. It'd be nice to do that. You may not be able to get hold of it, though. Failing that. Failing that, I think we'd go on to um, album tracks, because there are some nice album tracks. You can play any one of Till You Say You'll Be Mine, which is a Jackie DeShannon song, or there was... Uh, You've done a few by Jackie Deshaun. Yeah, too. she was a friend of ours. Needles and Pins was recorded by her, but not written by her. When You Walk in the Room was written and recorded by her. This one, Till You Say You'll Be Mine, was uh, it was an album track of hers, I think. Or was it a single? Can't remember. It's too long ago to remember that. But there's that one. Or there's I Don't Want to Go On Without You, which is a nice one. The Old Drifters thing. Lots of those LP tracks. Four Strong Miles is a good one. Okay. Four Strong Winds. Four Sorry, strong wins, yes. wrong time. Four strong wins. Mm -hmm. Another nice one. Oh, pick what you want. Okay, Frank. Thanks. Oh, we had so many disagreements. Right then, Frank. Um, I did want to come on to contemporary songwriters. Yeah. You've already mentioned Neil Sedaka, who is both of your <coughs> day originally, yeah. your first day, and of now, mm. in fact, very much of today with yeah. solitaire and songs. Are there any other contemporary songwriters whom you admire and would like to record? their material as singles. Oh, there must be hundreds about. I mean, Carol King is the same sort of thing as Neil Sedaka, isn't she? She's, yeah. a, she's of that era, but um, uh, modern, up to date. You know, uh, there are lots of people. Loggins and Messina, we like that kind of thing. Um, I like all free stuff. They write all their own stuff, don't they? Yes, they do. Good. We've, and we've just started doing a Peter Frampton one on stage that he wrote. In fact, it was his last single, I think. Um, was it? Show Me The Way. Ooh, yeah, a song called Show Me The Way. That's a good tune. I mean, uh, lots of people come out with um, very good songs every now and again. There are very few people who are absolutely consistent. Uh, who writes the Eagles songs? Do they write their own? They write their own material. Good songwriters. I like that. 
How about somebody, one name that springs to mind who might write material suitable for you is Albert Hammond. Albert Hammond, yes. Funny enough, we went for um, a meeting with Albert Hammond when we were in between record companies at one time to see what we were going to do, whether we were going to pr produce independently. This was a good few years ago now when he was still with um, Family Dog. Yes, uh, who was it? Steve, uh, what was the American oh, guy? Steve Rollins, yes. Um, but it never came off. I don't know, I haven't heard too much of his stuff. I heard Down by the River and um, what, what's the other thing? Band. Yeah, Free Electric Band, that's a good song, yeah. I don't know whether it's quite the kind of thing. It's definitely commercial. commercial. don't know whether it's absolutely us or not, but that's a, a nice kind of song. There must be lots and lots of songwriters around. Can you think of any at the moment that Sue does? Not really. Albert Hammond is the only one that I just thought might yeah. be in your I, I'd tell you who... Um, Believe it or not, he's a great fan of ours and who asked, we were in Australia at the time, but he asked for us to come to his show when he was in England recently. That was uh, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, really? Yeah. He's been knocked recently in the, the trip. Has he really? Yes, he's taken a, a Oh, perhaps we'll disown him then. <laughs> um, in fact, they were calling him the, um, well, sort of a musical equivalent to a white elephant. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I've gone wrong. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. There have been some good reviews of him. There have been some very good reviews, but uh, just in the past few weeks I've been reading. Yeah? And, uh, well, he does when you walk in the room on stage. Does he? Yeah. Oh. Apparently he was a great Searchers fan years ago. He got in touch with uh, someone while he was over here and said, uh, you know, get the boys to come to the show. But unfortunately we were in Australia. We only, he only heard about it when we came back. So possibly he might consider writing a song for you. It would be nice. It would be nice to have someone like him writing a song for us. It would be nice to have someone like him producing it, maybe. The, uh, the magic might rub off. Quite possibly. Going back to the, the old days again, I, I hope you don't mind this. No, no, no. The old days, but uh, you're, you do belong to the old days, really. True. Mm. Um, how did the style evolve? Because you emerged at the same time as the Beatles and all the other Mersey groups, yeah. and yet you didn't have that typically Mersey sound. Well, I do remember I wasn't there right at the beginning, but uh, the origins of the group were basically a country and western band. Really? Yeah, well, they were a backing group um, for, Johnny to, for Johnny Sand, and Johnny Sand and used to do a Jim Reeves kind of thing. So naturally, the leanings of the band was to a more melodic kind of uh, sound than maybe most of the other groups in Liverpool were doing, who were all in a big sort of, for that day, a kind of heavy thing. But they still emerged with an individual sound? Yes, well, most of the other people weren't doing that sweet kind of sound at the time. Most people recognise that, that, that the kind of songs the searchers sang and the kind of style they played in was a sweet, melodic, harmonic kind of sound, which is very akin to a country kind of feel. It's very much like lots of country-type artists are now. It's a similar to an Eagles kind of thing. Yeah, and very, yeah. very similar to the Birds. Yeah, yeah, yes. I hope it's changed a bit since then. Apart, I mean, our new songs aren't necessarily like that. But no. it was similar in, in those days. Good Except that I think maybe the birds came later. The, the birds did come later, yes. I was mm. wondering if there was any uh, kind of group of that ilk around at the time, you know, kind of forerunners we of the birds, or were no, the searchers, the people who made that sound, which the birds later cottoned on to? Could you claim that kind of honour? Quite possibly, because I don't think that there were there was any one sound around that the searchers took their staff from. I don't think there was anything recognisable. You could say, well, we uh, were influenced by them. Can't recall any groups of around that time. I'm sure it just happened. They they picked the songs that they liked, played them in the way that it was a very simple band. It was never um, in those days a um, very competent band musically. So therefore, it was a very simple kind of arrangements. Very straight, very simple, um, almost a skiffly kind of backing, really. Well, it was, Good if you listen to those, yes, it was, very, very, very basic. It's changed a lot now. The, the musical content is a lot more involved. It's, it's all changed around a whole lot. John has improved, like, about 3,000% in his guitar work. And I think we've all improved. Mike improved tremendously from the beginning of the group to the time when they had his, because he wasn't exactly the singer at that time. No. So things changed all the while. And at the beginning, you just took the songs and played them the best way you could, which was simple and sweet. Uh, I'm going to ask you an impossible question now. Since you've come yeah. on stage, you've been out signing autographs, and I've been talking to you about half a dozen people. 
um, outside yeah. who said, what a fantastic show you've just put on. And it really was. I thoroughly enjoyed yeah. it. The best show I've seen in a yeah. hell of a long time. Strangely enough, I mean, I shouldn't really say this, but uh, it was actually our weakest night of the week. Really? <laughs> yeah, funny enough, it was. Yes, every every other night, this is the fifth night of the week, and every other night has been um, a whole lot better. It's just a couple of, couple of odd... Um, Things went wrong tonight and throws yeah, just vaguely. Yes, one of the mics wasn't on to the start. A um, couple of words forgotten because you get a bit nervy about the whole thing. I dropped my bass. A uh, few yeah. odd noises. It was one of those nights, but I mean, it wasn't uh, a drastic night. And the audience no, seemed to like that the it. The audience noticed. No. Yeah, on the contrary. Um, it kind of gets me to the question because people were saying out there, how can a group be so good, have such a fantastic presentation, be so musical? and yet not have hit records. Uh, as I said, it's an impossible question. Is yeah. there any kind of answer to that? Basically, those people are caught up in the atmosphere, which is a lovely atmosphere, and it's a great atmosphere, and I feel if pe people who do come and see us realize what we can do and realize the potential in the group and the sound and what we what what is in the future for us. But, unfortunately, you have to get people who run record companies and who um, hold um, decent contracts. I'm not saying any contracts. We could get a contract tomorrow, but it wouldn't be what we wanted. Uh, you have to get those out to see you perform, and then they suddenly get involved with the atmosphere as well. Because if you're sitting in um, an office in London somewhere, um, and someone says the search is well, you think, oh, that group that was around 11 years ago playing those old-fashioned songs, and uh, what could they possibly have to do with us now? But though I'm sure they change their minds if. Uh, if they saw your act? Yes. I, I, I believe they would. Mm. So how, how can you possibly... How can we possibly change that? I, that's a very, very difficult yeah. thing. We almost did it once when we did a concert at the Palladium with the Everly Brothers. Uh, but we were already with RCA at that time anyway, and uh, picking flop records. <laughs> uh, so we weren't free to do anything with anyone else. But things like that bring people to your attention. If you... Uh, get little mini concerts in London, places... W the Everly Brothers and us was a per perfect combination. Yes, Both um, could be liked by the same kind of audience, neither clashed with the other. It was a nice evening. We shared the bill, we were on the first half, they were on the second half. And it was a lovely place for people to see us, but you don't get many of those concerts around for us. There'd be no point in us um, going on with some ultra-heavy group. Uh, because we've been fighting a losing battle, so you have to have the right concert as well. So, what's your hope for the group now for the future? Oh, hit records. Oh, the eternal optimists, we are. Oh, we can survive forever. This, this work never, this work just gets more and more. It gets higher paid all the time as well. The, the crowds become bigger and bigger all the time. Well, obviously, if you're a group, you have to aim for records, and that's the ultimate goal. Apart from a hit record, is, is there anything that the individual members of the group would like to do? Oh, there's all uh, sorts of things we'd like to do. you would like to be involved in, apart from just making records? If I, if I wasn't with the group? Yeah. Well, at the moment I'm writing a book anyway, so that my greatest ambition is to um, finish the book and uh, have this book published. What's the subject of the book? It's um, a novel, it's a pop <coughs> music, no, it's not really a music business, a show business novel. Uh, involvement. It's not autobiographical, it's not about a group really. It's about a singer, it's about an actress, it's about all sorts of people in the entertainment business. A couple of children's books I've got in mind as well. I would badly like to write. Uh, have you done some writing before? Mm, very badly. <laughs> for, no, four years ago I had a go at <clears throat> writing a book. It was my first attempt. I did write it, got it through. Very short, very bad. I didn't think it was bad at the time, but when I read it later it was awful. But this one I've taken a lot of time over. I've been writing it for about two years now. Um, had other people reading while I've been going along just to check that I've not been going wrong on the thing. So, I mean, it looks a lot more promising. I'm just about to sort of finish and then do a lot of rewriting. So that's my main ambition. I wouldn't mind doing some children's television as well. I like the idea of that. But that's, that's beyond the group, you know. That's yeah. nothing that would interfere with the group. You mean as a I, w I wouldn't do anything, yes, I wouldn't do anything that would interfere with the, with the band. That's all, you know, after we've decided not to do this anymore. But the book I can do at the same time, that's no trouble. What have you found that writing was your forte, you know, this book became... It's, it may not be my forte. Oh, well, what if I found it? Yeah. Um, that is 
a wildest dream. It's a lovely one. Terrific. Do you think you could possibly do it? You know, if the book did become a bestseller and publishes it, well, could you do another one for us in six months? Oh, time? certainly I could, yes. You could? Yeah. You've got that much no, maybe not in six years. months' time, but um, it takes some time to write a book out. Yeah, but sure. I, possibly I could. I would be if if I knew that I could do it. I mean, if if it was proved by the book selling that I could do it, then it would give me the confidence to actually just go straight ahead and do something. At the moment, I'm taking lots and lots of time because it's very difficult to be objective about your own writing. You, you you sit and write through something, and then you try and read it as someone else would read it, and it doesn't come out the same to you. So you have to get someone else to read it. Um, sometimes on rereading, the whole thing's terrible. I wrote a chapter the other day, and then went back to it. And I thought this just isn't right, and I just rewrote the whole thing. Have you got a title for it yet? Yes, yeah, a working title of the Lemmings. The Lemmings. Mm. Um, Little animals well, that rush to their destruction. Oh, it's, it's not the name of a family or. A... No, no, the Lemmings. It's um, it's a comparison to people in show business. I see. Right. As long as you know what a lemming is, then that's of Yes. And wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you very much. And uh, hope that in the future you do become a presenter of children's programs on television. Yeah. And still stay with the searches. Oh, yes. I mean, anything I'm talking about now is way after we've um, done all that. But not no, nothing, nothing. Well, the book I can do at the same time. The other it doesn't uh, even en enter into it until we've decided not to, um, not to do this anymore. But that's not going to be me because I'm still keen on it. Well, the best of luck with all your ventures, Frank, and uh, thanks very much for talking to us. Great, lovely. It's been beautiful. I hope the people in the hospital like it. Get well soon. Yes, I think we should give a little message to all the people in the hospital at Devizes. They'll be sitting there. Some of them will be miserable. Some of them will be quite happy, as always. But anyway, we'd like to cheer you up. So get well soon. Um, enjoy your stay in there, because hospitals are lovely places with all those nice nurses doing you good all the time. And to everyone, the very, very best of wishes.